because my connection was not. Yes. Yeah, okay. So welcome everybody. Welcome to this uh, life science uh, sex session. And it's my pleasure today to introduce the speaker of today's uh, talk that is uh, David Posada. He's coming from the Biomedical Research Center in the University of Vigo, and he was initially trained as a PhD in the, in the US, uh, then stayed as a postdoc um, at the MIT and, and one company, and came back uh, to Vigo with a Ramon Cajal grant, and then he got his, uh, his professorship. So David, uh, whenever you want, please. Okay. Thank you very much, it's a pleasure. It will be a you know, bigger pleasure to be there in person, but unfortunately we cannot make it these days. Okay, thank you. So I'm gonna give you an overview of, of things that we've been doing for the last years. So, which have been very long. I mean, I used to be a computational biologist and, you know, uh, six, seven years ago, I opened a wet lab and trouble started to become huge. But, so I'm, I'm gonna talk a little bit about wet lab and also try to focus on, on what I actually do, which is evolution and using, well, computational analysis of courses is a very important part of, of this research. Well, you might know that we accumulate mutations since the very first moment that, uh, can you see my pointer, that we are, you know, an egg, like a zygote, we start having a lot of mutations. We didn't know this clearly, I would say like 10 years ago, now it's very evident that somatic mutations are everywhere. No, and that we will accumulate thousands of millions of mutations during this talk in our body, fortunately in different cells. So this will won't matter that much, right? But through our lifetime, there are errors. That is the intrinsic mutation process. I mean, due to the polymerases, no? there is a error rate that is gonna, you know, result in, you know, one, two mutations per mitosis in general. Most of these mutations are irrelevant are irrelevant and, you know, through our infants and childhood, hopefully we'll have, you know, some mutations and nothing is gonna happen and we, that's gonna be like this through our own life. It's not just replication, but also there are environmental factors as we know, right? Like exposure to UV light, tobacco, food, you know, many things, oxygen, you know, many, many things that are there. And there might be mutations that increase this rate and well, we might have we do all of us have clonal expansions in our healthy tissues, right? That's something that has been more recently even like five years ago is very well described that there are expansions of cells of clones which are fitter than other clones and grow faster for, for multiple reasons and there are clonal expansions that again, they are not relevant in the sense of they don't affect, they don't create a pathology. But we all know that some, sometimes some of these mutations and these are called they have like a fight, fatal effect, you know, like a very bad effect, which is like, like an uncontrolled proliferation and that becomes a cancer, right? And the mutations that give this new function, these capabilities you know, to escape apoptosis, escape the immune system, grow very fast, grow in three dimensions and so on. The hallmarks of cancer are called driver mutations, right? In the cancer arena. In evolution, we will call these adaptive mutations, maybe. And all of them, all the rest in cancer, they call it passenger mutations, the ones that are irrelevant in general, and we call that neutral mutations in evolutionary genetics. So, so this is a process which is normal, happens all the time, and they, they can have, you know, like in these pathological effects. And cancer is probably one of the most important, or the most important, but not the only one, right? So uh, in the next years, we will see a lot of studies linking you know, somatic evolution with a bunch of diseases, with a variety of diseases for sure. We can see, display this same process in a, in a more familiar way for evolutionary biologists, which is like a tree and, you know, cancer is somatic evolution. And we have from a healthy cell, a mutation that gives, you know, an advantage or proliferates, divides, accumulates new mutations. These are the colors different mutations that have different a functional effect. There are selective pressures, which might be the immune pressure. And then only maybe one of the clones survives. Again, further evolution, some clones grow faster than others. They, they make a tumor. 
they can travel through a different ecosystem. This is called metastasis. There can be therapy, maybe only one minor clone survives and there can be a recurrence. So all this process right, is somatic evolution. And you know, these are, in this case, uh, cancer clones, but they might be different species. Right. And that's the link I made, no? And well, I made that many people made, but I made in my research. I mean, it's not, I didn't come up with this, right? And that's what I've been doing. So I used to work with populations, individuals, species, and no, I now I'm working with cells and clones, which are groups of cells which are identical and they have a common ancestor. Conceptually is the same, it's just evolution, I would say. So we, we may see that you know we have the more germline traditional evolution, what we call evolution, right? Is germline evolution. We have you know the divergence between you know human chimpanzees, and then we have divergence among different human populations, individuals within populations, and then cells within individuals. So it's a different level here, right? Where we have like evolution in our different cells, and then sometimes we have expansions which might be benign or malignant, which is the cancer, right? It's the same, all this process, this macroevolution, microevolution, somatic evolution, they might be seen as a continuous, but there are some differences here. So germline evolution in many organisms, or the, the, in most of the studies that we are used to see, is sexual, right? Proceeds through change through generations, and there is a process that to make the gametes with the recombination that has very uh, important implications. And the scale is thousands to millions of years, no? depends on what is the scale of your work, whether you work with populations of frogs, or whether you work with the, with the tree of eukaryotes. Right? Somatic evolution, what happened inside the bodies, no? the somas, is asexual. Um, maybe not 100%, there are things like mitotic recombination, but these are exceptions. It's asexual and there's no recombination, and there's a, effectively one single locus. The whole cancer genome is a single locus, okay? We know that there are some extracomosomal processes and things like that, and they might resemble recombination in some sense, but these are, you know, exceptions. So basically it's asexual, and the lifetime, the scale is totally different, it's years, and that is important. We need to take that into account when we analyze the data, because this has implications in not only conceptual of the things that because recombination is a very important for, for selection, for example, but also from the from the power that we have to, to see mutations, to call mutations. Even for the bioinformatic procedures, there are indeed differences between calling germline mutations and calling somatic mutations. So there are challenges, particularly challenges challenges to study cancer or somatic evolution is this evolutionary time. We have less mutations, right? Although the, we have many mutations in, in single cells, when we sequence, normally we sequence a bulk. So we only see the mutations that reach some threshold of frequency, right? Which are common mutations. So obviously we, we have less mutations that if we compare cells that from the same individual that if we compare individuals, obviously, right? Well, then there is like um, statistical challenges, which is there is a single locus. So effectively, there is a single observation of the evolutionary process, for example. And here, selection is extremely important. While in germline evolution, selection is important indeed, but we know that if we measure, you know, the non synonymous synonymous rate across the human genome is going to be well below one, right? So purifying selection, most mutations are purified across germline evolution no? in human populations, among species. So we use what is called neutral models in general, right? In cancer, can we use neutral models? Well, there is some debate at the beginning, everybody thought that cancer was all only selection. Now there is some debate about whether there is neutralims once the tumor is stable. Of, of course, for the tumor to grow, it needs to be better than the healthy cells. So there is selection. And selection has many implications regarding the evolutionary models that we use. Of course, there is a, another difference. Structural variants are very, very common in cancer. It changes among cancer types, but they are, you cannot ignore them. You know, and it's true that there are in human populations, of course, structural variants, but in, in, in cancer, they are pervasive. I mean, they, they occur all the time, and sometimes they might be even more relevant or more common than single point mutations than SMB. And another concept, which is the, how we take samples. And that's very important 
for us. And there are different ways of getting samples, not just one, which is, well, which is bulk sequencing, which is the normal sequencing. You get a piece of a tissue and then you sequence and you're sequencing millions of cells at the same time. You can grab several bulks from different regions in space. This is not as common in the clinic, but if in, a, in the academic setting, you, you, can, you can convince a pathologist to do this for you. We need to sample always tumor and healthy because we need to disentangle which mutations are germline and somatic. So for that, we use always paired samples, healthy and tumor. And we can also analyze data now at the single cell level. We can also sequence cells which are not in the tumor which, or which are in the, in the blood, right? I mean, in the blood, there, are, there is DNA from the tumor and there are tumor circulating tumor cells, which are the ones that uh, are responsible for the metastasis at the end. So we have all these ways of sampling. And sampling is very important because it's, it's different as when we go to in organismal evolution, when we sample, for example, snails in, in, in Cape Verde, we go, we have some expectations, right? So we have we can recognize populations of different individuals, right? Because we go there and we sample different beaches and we assume that snails from different beaches or different islands they are independent we can see their phenotype there are some features which are geographical environmental or morphological that can give us clues about whether we are sample you know a single population you understand but in cancer no because what is a tumor a tumor is a mass of cells the pathologist is not going to distinguish features of the tumor so basically bulk sample is what we call pool sequencing which is some people do to afford money is that you get uh, you know 20 drosophilas and then you sequence all them at once right so that's a technique that is used sometimes basically to to get more data assuming that all these pool are related individuals so you can do that and that's pool sequencing so cancer is always pool sequencing and therefore are not populations and this has evolutionary implications everybody does this in cancer and well like a few years ago we realize that you know this has implications and when you treat your tumor samples as populations and you try to build phylogenies things like that basically you are mixing lineages so every sample is not a single millis and a single lineage in fact you have a mixture of lineages when you sample three samples from this you have you know different clones here in colors which are mixed because your samples are pools and these what the people build in cancer normally are, are what we call sample trees. And this is not necessarily the same as population trees or clone trees or allele trees or haplotype trees. It's different. These are mixed things. And we have to be careful with that because we saw here that then you can have homoplasis, which are not real. I mean, it seems like a mutation changed twice, occur type when in fact only occur once, right? So you infer spurious parallel changes you mix up the order of the branches, the length, and that's very important. So despite that we publish this, this is largely largely, in, largely ignored. You know, in many nature papers, they keep doing these phylogenies with samples, which are mixes of things, you know. But it's very important that to understand that to study evolution, we need to work with, you know, identifiable and lineages, okay? These are, how do we get lineages on cancer if we get biopsies? Well, we need to either identify the clones or use single cells. Okay, so we explore both approaches. Identif how do we identify a clone? So if this is the evolution of a tumor through time and I get a single slice of here, I'm gonna get a mixture of clones. I need to deconvolute them. How do I do that? Well, there is something which is a bioinformatic okay, uh, process which is based on some algorithms that assume, for example, things like the, that a mutation cannot happen twice in the same site. And this is clonal deconvolution, which is a very extremely difficult problem that has not been solved and that has been you know, addressed by many groups in many different places. But we know, because we've done simulations, like that, that this is not solved. And it's basically, well, you need to combine you know, some matrices. Basically, the idea is that if there is no recombination, Two mutations that are the same frequency, they should travel together in the same haplotype. They should be linked. That's the idea underlying this. But of course, you know, this doesn't have to be true all the time. So mostly these methods 
for the most part, are unable to give you reliable clones often, right? So that's not the main idea. But that was the only type of approach that we have when we started to try to infer evolutionary parameters in, in, in data. So, so this is a, a study, which is what we want to do, right? To understand the evolution of tumors here from, from a more quantitative point of view. And um, well, inferring clones with different methods and you know, curating this data and making you know, some simulations and you know, some comparisons about clones with different approaches and making some, some decisions, we were able to infer some evolutionary parameters in a more quantitative way. Normally in cancer, people use this, the trees they build among samples and that's the end. They put a tree there and they say, well, that's it. Now we are interested in inferring, for example, growth rates, how they change through time, the age of the tumors. Here, this is a single patient, it's an autopsy. And so we could infer the age of the of the tumor, the growth rate, so in, in with numbers, and the phylogeography, which is the migration patterns through time. So using some statistical models, we can infer the ancestral location of some nodes in the phylogeny and then infer how many migration events happen. So for example, in this patient, all these clones were in the metastasis and all these were in the primary tumor. So we infer a single metastatic event that gave rise to you know, all the metastasis in lymph nodes and in liver. And we infer also the root and so on and in time and in space, right? So we want to do what we want to aim at the, at the end. What we want to understand is the evolution of a tumor in time and space, right? Similar things that we do with lizards or in islands or you know, or with other type of organisms, we want to understand, use these techniques in cancer. So that's the, that's the main idea, right? And here we use it using clones, but clones is not enough because clones are prone to errors. They are not reliable because you need to do these inferences. And as I explained one minute ago, this is not reliable in my opinion, clonal inference because it's very difficult to identify clones just using allele frequencies. So we got into trouble. We, we got, I totally got out of my comfort zone, open a wet lab and tried to do single cell genomics. And you know that the standard genome sequencing, basically you get a bunch of cells, get loads of DNA and then you sequence and there are some errors and then variant colors try to deal with these errors. And you might agree to some extent that depends on who you ask that you know, calling your line variants is more or less easy, maybe. Single cell is different, single cell, we grab a single cell somehow, there are different approaches to isolate cells. And then we don't get much DNA, right? For a single cell, we get six picograms, which is nothing. So we need to amplify this DNA before doing anything with it. Before, to build a, a library, a sequencing library, we need to amplify the DNA. And this amplification, as you will see in the next slide, introduces some biases. So when we have single cell data compared to bulk data, to tissue sequencing, we have many more errors. And, and these errors are basically the most important that, that when we amplify the DNA, we might miss the amplification of one of the chromosomes or one of the, you know, nucleotizing one of the chromosomes, maybe the maternal or the paternal. So basically what it was an heterozygote looks like an homozygote. We might also, which is, this is called allele dropout, or sometimes you miss both alleles, maternal and paternal, and then you get total dropout, which is you know, a locus dropout, and that's missing data. And also sequencing errors, which is less important. The most important bias is allele dropout, sequencing errors in which, you know, when you do these reactions to amplify, which are PCR-like, you have different approaches as you will see next, but basically you can introduce errors, additional errors. The uniformity is in a, when you sequence a, a population of cells is more or less homogeneous. When you have single cell data, you have a lot of heterogeneity in your coverage. And this heterogeneity changes or not from cell to cell depending on the kit. So that's things we had to investigate. At the end of the day, when you have a single cell genotype matrix, compared to a, to a bulk matrix, what you have is much more missing data and many more errors. So you, you need to apply a different type of filters or statistical procedures. To understand how this process work and what would be the best approach to, to do the single 
cell whole genome amplification. So we started a benchmark study with uh, people in our lab mainly. I've been, you know, so collaborating on this with people in CENAC, with Amy and Holger Hein. And we evaluated, you know, type of methods, which I'm not going to get into this, but basically we took us years to do this and complete, and we had to redo many things because to discard things like contamination is also important. You need to detect contamination. So basically we measure quality in the sense of breadth, in the sense of uniformity of the coverage, which kids are better. Recurrence, that's very important for, because if you want to study, you know, uh, you want to do evolution with this data, what you want to have is many columns of data, so many SMBs filled with data. You want to have many, but what you, what you want is that you get the same data from the same cells. So the same SMBs from the same cells. So basically, instead, if the amplification of the genome is at random, you're going to get a very sparse matrix with missing data all the place. But if you get a kit where the amplification is recurrent, tends to amplify better the same regions, you're going to get more consistent data for the evolutionary analysis because you're going to have homologous regions, okay, more often than if the kit is at random. Okay, this might be counterintuitive, it is not, but in fact, we prefer kits which tend to amplify the same regions, okay, because then we get the same regions amplified for different cells and we can compare them, right? So we Ampli1 is the best one in this case, ReplyG, which was the most famous one, is very bad for this. So if you want to do, you know, a neonatal diagnostic, you can use ReplyG, but if you want to do phylogenetic trees from single cells, you shouldn't use ReplyG. And it took us some time to realize of this. Okay, also about allelic imbalance. So here is the, well, compared to the bulk, if you single a bulk and then you look at the frequency of uh, the alternative allele, allele at heterozygocytes, it should be around 0.5, obviously, right? And only one kit is able to recover the same pattern, right? Why? Because the kit may have a preferences to amplify some of the allele versus the other, okay? Because of the composition, because it's a C instead of a G or whatever, right? We also measure them a little dropout rates for different kits. Of course, we prefer rates with a small a little dropout. Look at this, a small is, is 15%. You're gonna miss a lot of data. And, you know, indel sensitivities and so on. So based on this, this is our, our, our own data. We decided which the, the best kit to use and it's Ampli1. That's the way we're using our lab right now. And we develop bioinformatics tools to do quality control of the single cell sequencing libraries and so on in all this, in all this process, right? So, but that was important. Well, we want to do this, okay? The, if we realize and we look at the somatic phylogenies, basically, well, we can, if we can infer clones sometimes, well, so we're gonna look at these, but clones in fact are, you know, cells. So we actually want to have the cell phylogeny, but the cell phylogeny, because there is no recombination, is the same for the maternal and the paternal genomes. So the history of the paternal genomes and the history of the maternal genomes are mirrors of each other, okay? Because there is no recombination. Do you understand this? I mean, if there is a combination, it doesn't happen. In your line evolution, this is not true, okay? Because there is a combination during when you make the gametes. But in mitosis, this is true. And why I'm saying this? Because that allows us to build deployed genotype models for this. So in a standard statistical phylogenetics, we use this type of matrices when we have only one letter here, because we look at one sequence for chimp, one from human, one from gorilla but only one sequence, right? Haploid, we, ask, we ignore the intraspecies polymorphisms in these comparisons most of the time. But in cancer, we cannot do that because we do have deployed data and we want to distinguish you know, a TT from, and from an AT, right? And so we build these Markov models with uh, 10 states if you, they are unfazed and 16 if for phased states, which is the same concept. We can do the same calculations when we do maximum likelihood phylogenies, but with this type of models. And on top, we need a layer of, to take to deal with the observational error. We have errors when we observe them, the genotypes in single cells, as I mentioned before, because a lead dropout and, and amplification 
and sequencing errors. So we build, these are very easy. Basically, you can calculate these probabilities based on two parameters, which is you know, the error rate, which is a black box, which includes amplification errors, sequencing errors, and calling errors, and a little dropout. And then you can build all the probabilities for observing you know, a, a genotype, which is the true is AB, and you can observe an AA, and all the combinations, right? Alternatively, we some colors give you genotype likelihoods. You could use that for all the 10 genotype likelihoods. You could use the likelihood from colors that, I don't know if you know them, because they are specific for single cell, like monobar or sci-fi. So with all these, so I talked with some friends, which I say the, from the Stamatakis lab. You might know them because they are the authors of RaxML, which is a famous program. And I say, hey, guys, why don't we implement this model in your software? Because why? reinvent the wheel. So RaxML is a tool which is optimized for fast computations of phylogenies, and that's what we did. So we implemented this, this, this model, cell phi, right? And it's, it's, it's been now in the third round of review, <laughs> but it's, the preprint is being available for, for one year or two now. I don't know, it took us a long time. And well, this method is we Benchmarked for this, I, I wrote this simulator for simulating uh, single cell genotypes, right? With all these errors and evolution across demographic periods and growth because the tumors grow. So, so I wrote this tool. Okay, all, all what we do is always in GitHub, okay, available for free. And basically, we had a tool and we did a benchmark in which we compare our tool against, you know, standard parsimony. Well, because something which is not developed for cancer, but it's very fast, and some people use it in cancer, and then some tools which were developed for cancer by some people in some in different labs in the world, they develop these tools. So perform our methods in red, and it's better. When there is no error, and at all, there is no a little dropout. So this is like a data, like typical data, no single cell data, no error at all. All the methods are quite good, okay? But as error increases, most met all the methods start to perform worse as expected, but our method is seems, at least in our simulation, seems, seems to be the best one, right? Um, under different conditions. In If you use the just the genotype likelihoods from our color, so so my simulator can also, can also simulate the likelihoods, okay? Using some the same models in JTK. For 30x, you have 2,000 MBs, so models are different, tools are more or less equally good, unless there's error, parsimony starts to fail very easily when there is a little dropout. But when you are in trouble, you have either to the right or down, this is the worst place, a lot of a little dropout and a lot of amplification error. Our methods, to the variations of our methods are, are best. Okay, so, so our tool, pace to use this type of Markov models is increases performance. And look at this. This is 30x. We never sequence a cell at 30x. Why? Because we don't want to sequence a cell. We want to sequence 100 cells, whole genomes, because we want to have many SMBs. This is a lot of money. So we normally sequence at 5x. And at 5x, we are not better. We are absolutely better than the rest of the methods. Why? Because we have a statistical model that is gonna you know, take these likelihoods into account. So we don't work only with the most likely genotype, but also with all of them at the same time. So we take into account what is called genotype calling uncertainty. And when there is trouble at five fakes, right, we are absolutely much better. That's that in our simulations, okay? But that's, it is. And we can deal with large data sets, how, how much? Well, at five fakes, we can deal with 50,000 SMBs, you know, and even 1,000 cells. And we can estimate parameters very, very well. We estimate the allele dropout very well. So truth is the, the dot, and this is our estimates. Sometimes we do some subestimation, but in general, we are very close to the true values because our method is a maximum likelihood model, and then we can do maximum likelihood optimization also of the parameters like the allele dropout rate and the estimation rate. And we're very fast. So we are at least one, one order of magnitude 
faster than all the methods developed for cancer so far. Not that parsimony. Parsimony is, of course, absolutely fast because it's the simplest method in phylogenetics. It's parsimony so is much faster, but across different types of data set, right? So we can calculate, for example, for this data set, 100 cells, 10,000 SMBs. This is what, 1,000 seconds, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, right? That's the, the calculation. And, you know, even, you know, two minutes, 100 seconds, two minutes for a data set like this. And this is real data, these two. These are simulations. So we are, well, this is like a good commercial for us, no? We are more accurate in our simulations and faster. Okay. How about real data? Well, when we applied to, to real data, so we wanted to do some, um, sanity check. We do estimate the confidence in the tree. We do estimate booster proportions. Other methods, they don't do this, right? So we can see where, and that's important. Well, people publish trees, cancer trees in nature without bootstraps or without any type of measure of the, whether your tree is good or not all the time. And well, that's a mistake. Why? For example, this is a data in which what they did is isolate um, cells from this from blood okay growth clones and then sequence the clone so basically they're doing bulk and then they only trust they only use the clonal mutations in these clones that they were you know obtained from a single cell so these are single cell colony sequencing in that data they know, there's no single cell error because they didn't need to amplify the genomes okay but if you look on and the clonal mutations you can build still they are still individuals they are still the mutations that were in the cell that you expanded into a clone, right? So this is ideal, but it's, uh, it's a lot of work and only, you know, like a powerhouses like the Sanger Center can do this type of analysis because this is a lot of money and requires a lot of people to do this, but they study hematopoiesis using this, right? So we obtain the data and we build on this phylogeny, which is, looks like a star tree as expected because you are sampling so the ancestor of these cells might be close to the zygote, right? And now you are, we have billions of cells, so you are sampling only a few, right? 140 colonies, so therefore it has to look like this. And also growth has this effect on phylogenies. And, but it's a confident phylogeny. So, so we say, okay, you, we, they didn't publish these bootstraps, okay? But because they don't, didn't have it, but we can see that we are confident. And interestingly, when we estimate the allele dropout, we estimate the allele dropout of zero, as it has to be. Okay, so our method is also working well in this regard. Okay, now if you look at this data, which is from neurons, okay, there's absolutely no support. And people is writing papers about you know whether this population is different than this in some biological aspect, when there is absolutely no support. The fact that you can build a tree doesn't mean that you can say things about this tree. So, you know, we have a tool now that I think is important that that go along these lines to, to make sure that you do have phylogenetic signal or not in your data. Because we will see, we are seeing a lot of somatic phylogenies in, in the next few years. Okay. Also, sometimes, you know, our using um, what I think, and I think I can argue is a better method, changes the biological insights. So this is some paper published by Nick Navin Lab like a few years ago. They claim that, you know, single cell sequencing reveals, you know, that metastases are late in colorectal cancer and they can be multiple, multi, what is called polyclonal metastasis when you have different clones in different times colonizing the liver independently. So multiple colonizations, the metastasis, right? And well, they say it's late. I don't know why, because they don't have time in, in this in mutation tree at all. When we analyze this data, we get a different answer. We, in fact, see, we don't see a two metastases here, but we see a single event, which is more or less well supported by bootstrap and with all the metastatic cells clustered together. So we have a different, if we have to write this paper, our title will be quite different than their title, right? So better methods can give you you know, different insights. And my guess is that you know, if I have to bet, I prefer this inference than this, no? the conclusions from this than from, from that. We do analyze our own data. And here we can, you know, some of the uses and the, the, the tree is the beginning of the analysis. We want to use these trees to understand what, for example, which mutations happen 
where whether cells cluster by geography or whether they cluster by some phenotype like stemness. So, so we measure, we, we sort cells using facts and we use some markers for stemness and what would you have here, right? It become that's what I two more cells in the column in the column and LGR5 and oh, CD44 and CD166. And well, we see that there is some clustering. You know, what, what do we spec? Do we spec all the tumor stem cells cluster with none? Not necessarily because the tumor stem cells, there's something called the, the tumor stem theory, which is that the mass of the tumor is you know provided by the always by tumor stem cells that you know that provide all these tumor cells. And in, it, this can be in a single wave or in multiple waves. And so here we can try to learn whether we have several or multiple. Here we'll have two waves of, of tumor non-stem cells arising from tumor stems. And then we can identify some putative driver genes, driver mutations in, in known cancer genes and also unknown that they might have you know, some different relevance or not. So that, that might be the, the use. Now in our lab, so we are doing a bunch of analysis with multiple patients, and this, these are the type of numbers where we are working now with this, right? Like on the 20, 30, 50,000 SMBs and you know dozens of cells. Well, we, we build a lot of sequencing libraries, sometimes fail some of them at sequencing. It's not always clear what you are gonna get, but we are able to get now more or less with some you know success rate some good data we, we can identify usual suspects of driver mutations and, um, and maybe new ones in different genes and which makes sense right some recurrence of genes the nice things of doing single cells is that you can detect things which are rare also okay if you're lucky with your samples right and then you can distinguish heterogeneity when you, you only do bulk sequencing, all this heterogeneity get pulled together into a single allele frequency. Here we can try to distinguish that. We're building phylogenies, and then we're trying to infer to infer things. So for this, using phylogeographic and phylodynamic approaches, which is what we typically use for organism, organisms, right? To infer the age, to infer the growth rate, to infer the migration routes. So this is this is the pacing one. We also, also analyze this using clonal deconvolution in the paper I saw at the beginning of the talk. And using single cells, we, we also recover like a single mono, metastatic uh, origin for all the metastatic cells. Here we also have a benign tumor that we saw that is independent. So here, this patient had two tumors. One was malignant, the colorectal cancer, other good use benign. They are independent. They arise from, from a different population of healthy cells here in blue. And now, so this is really extremely well supported. Okay. At the beginning, we increase support doing things like this. At the beginning, normally we identify copy number, we identify the copy number profiles of the cells, and we just get SMBs, single type variants in, in copy neutral regions, because our model is deployed. But now we realize that we don't need to do this. We can also consider regions when there were amplifications. And then assume that ATT is the same as AT. And doing this, we get much better resolution. We still need to filter out regions with deletions because deletion is a problem. Because you have an heterozygote with a deletion, it's going to look like an homozygote. So that would create homoplasy, and our trees will be will be better. Now, the next step is doing things like we are doing, for example, in this study with Sulaf and Mamluk from the Charité and other people. And we, we want to understand whether you know the relapse in a patient after therapy. In, a, in the liver is, is a single population or multiple populations and which are the uh, mutations. This is a plot of the non mutations in, the, in these cells and doing this phylogenies guides our analysis, right? So we can identify single populations which make a lot of sense uh, geographically. This is the, the first metastasis and this is the relapse in the liver. It's a single relapse, only one lineage survive the treatment Right, and give rise to all the cells that organize more or less into space in some lineage, not, not here in the other. But we are very interested in the genes, in the changes that happen along this relapse, okay? Because these are candidates to be responsible for the relapse, the mutations that happen during this time. We put time here so we can measure, you know, and here we have the, 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 the important events like the resections and the chemotherapy. They were like the, the tumor is, or the, this is 
the, meta the first metastasis, it was like three years ago, that's our estimate. And this is one year ago, less than one year ago. Okay, they relapsed during these two years. There was no noticeable disease. Okay, they couldn't see, but using these phylogenies, we also want to understand what happened and hopefully, you know, propose potential candidates to be looking further. Now we're looking at the which pathways are involved in these genes, whether they might have some properties that might explain why they relapse in the liver. Okay, because this is a relapse in the liver not in the colon and so on. So this is the, the type of applications. Here we're measuring, we're using uh, uh, models in, in BIST, which is a software for phylogenomic inference, where we can do like a posterior estimate of parameters about the substitution rate. So we're seeing places where there might be like the substitution rate increased, like in some branches. So we're trying to make sense all of this to tell a biological story of uh, what is happening on, on this, right? And Finally, we are also doing other disease very fast. I'm going to skip them. We are also using, although this is not the focus of, of our of our lab. Now we are more centered into colorectal cancer, but we also work with leukemias, with CLL. We do identify with single cells driver mutations. It's easier to, to sequence like a liquid tumor than a solid tumor because you don't need to do the disgregation of the tumor that always alters the cells and can induce some biases. And we can identify mutational signatures from single cells, of course, as well. So here we can distinguish. Uh, mutational signatures are just patterns of, of mutations taking into account the immediate base three prime and five prime, the triplets, or the context, the genomic context. And this in cancer, these uh, patterns have been related to the polymerase, which is this, SBS1 and 5, to smoking. You can tell whether a people smokes just looking at these mutational signatures. No, the patterns of the, which type of mutations in which context they take place. And we can also infer this from single cells and, and we are discovering a few new interesting signatures, but we are finishing this. And also we are trying to understand whether, you know, therapy before therapy and after therapy, there are particular populations of cells that survive and to study their features. This is not the case for this patient. Here, multiple lineages survive the therapy also, whether what, what is the circulation between the bone marrow and the, and the peripheral blood, whether there is only a, a single wave you know, of, of CLL tumor out of the bone marrow. But here, this intermixing the phylogeny, which is well supported, suggests that there is recirculation of the, of the tumoral cells in the blood through the bone marrow to the peripheral blood. So this is the type, the type of things we want to infer. To summarize, because I think I already talked, Long time. Well, I hope I convinced you that you know the typical statistical models that we use in organismal biology can be applied in cancer evolution. We need to twist them a little bit. They have to become deployed. We need to, if we use, we need to use single lineages, and either you use clones if you trust them, or single cells because we need individuals, not pools of individuals, to do uh, phylogenetics. And we have done this, and we have. You know, develop a program in maximum likelihood estimate. We are now also doing this into BIST. So now we have this into a basic approaches that can also estimate uh, growth, for example. But we are f finalizing this, doing simulations to prove that they work well. And that, yeah, we can build trees, but and that is that the end of the story? No, we can infer parameters. We can infer growth rates for trees. And this is our interest. Our interest is not, is not building trees. Our interest is to infer in parameters from trees, like movement, like rates of substitutions and rates of growth to identify you know, potential candidates, mutations or groups of cells that they have some features. You could, you could put phenotypes onto these trees. You could put expression. You could put whatever you want phenotype that you have from these cells and see whether, you know, how study the evolution of the phenotypes with this type of approaches. And these insights sometimes change the conclusions, right, of using this type of methods, no? And, well, the corollary is that evolutionary biology, of course, because cancer is evolution, can provide, you know, a more quantitative understanding than, than tumoral dynamics. Well, all this work, of course, is, has been, uh, what happened? Now, there's a lot of people collaborating in different aspects of this. We try to, now we produce the data, we are doing a lot of benchmarks in the lab and also in the, in the, in the, 
inform by informatic approaches or statistical approaches we develop, we also benchmark everything. We are very much in variant, single subvariant calling, where we are benchmarking multi regional bulk variant calling, you know, a, a bunch of things. And of course, there is funding from this. was I got out of my comfort zone. What for to, for the ERC? This was an ERC grant, the study cancer evolution. And we have other other funders for different, you know, spin-offs of this project around liquid biopsies, for example. And that's everything. Thank you very much for for your attention. Thank you, David. This this was really wonderful talk. And I'm sure everybody, although we cannot hear them, they are clapping at home in front of their screens. So now we have time for, for questions. So uh, please, everyone that has a question, just uh, unmute yourself and, and go ahead with the question. In the meantime... Yeah, I see two I hands see the, there. Okay, wow. I don't see the hands. Okay. Yeah, please Eduard, Miguel, I don't know. Eduard is on the left, maybe Eduard. Do I see more people? Maybe, I don't, I don't, know, if, I don't know if I see everybody. Okay, Hi, yeah. Hi. I don't see hands. I don't know. <laughs> maybe maybe they are hidden or something. Uh, beautiful talk. Uh, I, I really liked it. Uh, I you. totally sympathize with uh, getting out of the comfort zone. I just sent my first libraries to Korea this morning. Uh, so I, I totally feel you. I, I have uh, a lot of scientific and, and technical questions. So let, let me begin with the, with the technical ones. So you show data for some patients that spans, I don't know, like five or six years. So which kind of samples are you actually analyzing? Are they like fresh frozen or, or ah, yeah, yeah. embedded or? No, uh, uh, well, first the ones I can get. <laughs> <laughs> because who is the boss here, the pathologist? Basically, uh, and, uh, I'm Vigo, so in Vigo then the, the hospitals are not really into research. You know, that's different in Santiago. There's, of course, totally different in Barcelona, right? So basically, they do this in their free time, but they at three. P Sometimes they say, "No, sorry, at three p.m. they close and that." So I get, you know, the the what I can get now. The, what I can get is regarding, you know, normally uh, colectomies, right? In the case of colorectal cancer, and but is in the case of colorectal, it's frozen, frozen tissue because paraffin will be another layer of trouble i mean you, i mean you, you can work with that but so far we have been working all the time with frozen because you can use you can do single cell from paraffin well mm. then you can do laser you know capture micro dissection and do that but oof, that would be much more traumatic ne next next grant then you can do you know more or less this type of things but you know uh, it's, it's fresh frozen because that we can disregard and cells are still alive, right? So we, we test for, for, I mean, we only use live cells when we sort them, blah, blah, blah. But the material is fresh frozen for colorectal cancer and for CLL is blood, of course. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then um, regarding the, also another little bit technical one. So you mentioned at some point that it's better to have, um, to use kits that always amplify the same regions. Right. For if you want to study evolution, yes. But then why do whole genome and, and not just sequence panels of genes? Well, because then I, I will get much, much less SMBs. Yeah, because now I'm getting 50,000. I mean, if you want to estimate growth rates, from you need to have data. No, no, no. This, right. this has been, I mean, I could do whole exome also, right? And then it would be a little bit, but the number of SMBs that uh, people get is much less because uh, you know if you use exome or a panel, maybe I will get 20 SMBs. I see a lot of papers like this, 30 yeah. SMBs. In this case, I get 30,000. Okay. No, it's, yeah, I think um, this pro that's why it's an ERC. You're going to do this with other type of grant, right? Because it's very mm -hmm. expensive. Yes. Uh, so, yeah, so, so the idea was I want to get a lot of mutations. So I have power to infer parameters from the phylogenies. Okay, and then uh, I saw- Sorry, Edu Eduard, just to give uh, the opportunity for more people to it, ask. It's just a very small one. <laughs> so uh, this is a more scientific one. So- uh, but you, yes. you have a time to- Sorry? <laughs> 
of the quick. So th there was there was a recent paper showing record mutations not in cancer cells, so record somatic mutations not in cancer cells but in the stroma. Do you do you have data in? Do you see it in the single cell analysis? Yeah, 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 yeah. We do. Uh, in fact, our model, the, uh, the the Markov model we use. They were born to deal with this because you know you, you don't have uh, that's homoplasy, right? Recurring mutations, mm -hmm. then phylogenetics is trivial, right? Because if every mutation happens in a different part, phylogenetics you can do it with your eyes. Now we see that, but it's very difficult to tear apart whether it is that is uh, real or not because of the whole genome amplification. Now we have a model in, in, in two bees in posterior that we can pinpoint a little dropout happening here and there. But we see that sometimes, even the same nucleus that's changing, yeah. And there, are, there is a paper by Peter Manlou lab showing that this happens. I mean, one easy spot is like, look at for uh, triallelic sites in cancer. There are triallelic sites in cancer. So, so mutation did to happen, times. It, it happens. It's not as common as in your Lyme evolution, but obviously because the, the time scales are different, but it can happen. Absolutely, in the same gene, absolutely, because there is a selective pressure, right, to, to mutate, you know, to keep mutations in some genes, which are important for the cell to become better and better at growing. But at, at the single site, yeah, we see that, but this, I would say that this doesn't happen that often. It happens, but not that often, just because of question of chance. No? Thank, thank you very much, David. Thank you. Thank you. So now, Miguel, you can... Ask your question. Uh, hi, David. Uh, hi, great David. talk. I love it. You. Um, I have, I, I guess it's so. Uh, it's one question, but it regards. You started at the beginning saying that when you sequence the single cells, you're not going to get the cells really well read because there's going to be gaps and also and and then you listed a bunch of errors. Then your method okay. seems to work over a genotype, a oh, deployed genotype that um, that you're deriving from sequencing data. Hmm. I guess there's the step from how well you derive the genotype from the sequencing data must be very important. And um, yeah, you mentioned well, that you were looking at, uh, at regions with stable copy number and things like that. OK. Well, yeah, there's some. There's, um, in fact, that question is multiple. No? I mean, we there are single cell colors dedicated single cell scores. Okay, mm -hmm. Monobar, Sci-Fi are the most are the most famous. They they will be they, they they have been developed for calling, you know, genotypes in single cells, taking into account errors and sometimes they use cell by cell, but uh, look at this. When you have you can look, you can also use the information from other cells in the same population. Mm -hmm. That's called right. joint calling. Right. I mean we do that in with, with human populations. Right, you can do and and your your so I guess my question is that when you mentioned benchmarks, I was interested in the benchmark yeah, part. We are, are benchmarking you, your single benchmarking, cell calling. Single cell calling. Oh, interesting. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. We are doing this now. This is a project of a, uh, one of my students in the thesis, is doing part of her thesis in this, using in fact it's a very sophisticated simulation with real reads, like spiking in mutations in real reads okay. from real profiles of single cell sequencing in our lab. So we're, we're respecting the allelic imbalance that we have in real data. So, so we're doing this because there are benchmarks, of course. I mean, this, this monobar and this, these are published in nature methods or these methods, and they do, a, I would say, very convenient or very easy okay. uh, simulations. And they claim, yeah, we are good. And then and there's- you're, And you're simulating on the reads also SMVs and copy number alterations and things like that. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. That's very interesting. Seems, well, seems very complicated. Well, no, we, we use the real reads. Oh, you use the real reads? We spike mutations in real reads. Ah, OK. OK. And uh, real depth okay. profiles across the genome. So therefore, there, I mean, colorectal cancer is not, is not, there are structural variations. There are, it's not the one that has most structural variations, but there are. Mm -hmm. and, and so we are, we are taking that into account. Okay. Now, when we do the calling, we filter out we, we also estimate that there are dedicated colors for copy numbers in single cells also. OK. OK. okay. So the, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, for single cell SMBs, there are five or six. For copy numbers, there are two, I would say, or three. You know, mm -hmm. this is an active area. Sometimes you can, you can also use what's called a linked reads. You can use information from the linked um, germline mutations. Uh-huh. Linked. Yeah, oh, yeah which are in the same read. Yeah, right. which are in the same so read as your SMB. 
you can right, use exactly. the information to see whether there was a relic imbalance and these type of things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there, there is a, there is a full. This is that's, there is a that's fascinating, paper. fascinating yeah. stuff. Thanks, uh, no. David. Okay, so there is. If you maybe I can send you papers. No, there are. There is like a people working on this. Yeah, I mentioned this because I'm working on simulating uh, reads, and I I simulate a phylogeny, and then I simulate SVs, and then I use a read simulator to simulate the whole thing. Yeah. I'm thinking it could be interesting to simulate, you know, a data set for single cell. No, it I is. And, able to mirror yeah, that. no, no, no. We, we, I mean, we do have simulators for like, like yours, like it simulates uh, reads in along phylogenies. Mm -hmm. With uh, single cells, it's a little bit more complex to do it. You know, okay. and my simulator doesn't simulate reads, simulates read counts, okay. which is different for, right. for uh, independent. So I assume independent counts okay. for each nucleotide. Because the problem is the dependence among sites in the coverage. Right. Right. Yeah, because yeah. You, you can assume a Poisson for the whole thing, but in single cell, mm, mm. you know, the correlations of the depth, because there are all these, you know, uh, dropouts, okay. is not easy. It's not easy to simulate a, a read, a complete read for a single cell, I would say. I I'm, I I'm saying it's impossible, but. So. Okay. Okay. Thank you. That, that, that helps. I, I will be happy to talk with you about this. I yeah, think, I, I love it. Yeah, but it's it. much more involved eh, than than with for bulk sequencing for this okay. dependence. It, it'd be interesting to me just at least to have the conversation and understand it. Thank you. Sure, anytime. Just email me or anytime you want. Thanks a lot, David. Thank you. So I don't see any any more no. nice hands. I have very two quick questions. Maybe one is whether you. I mean, you talk about your models are diplot and assume no recombination. And I wonder whether with your data, you can also identify, you know, recombination events in, in the data. Yeah. I tried just uh, yeah, at the very beginning, because as you know, I work in recombination and detecting recombination at the, for my PhD, in fact. And that one, no, I didn't, I didn't see it. And I didn't see it. So, I mean, one simple thing is to build phylogenies across the genome, right? Things like that, I don't see it. I, okay. I think it probably, probably can happen but it's, it has to be rare, no? It's like, in the, like in, well, we know mitotic recombination is responsible, for example, for the colors of the cuts, some patterns like the, you know, some some mosaicisms here and there in the calico patterns of cuts. I mean, it's no, it's well known in genetics, no? But at this, tells you, I think that things that could happen, I like recombination, is like intake of DNA from the medium. They have some extrachromosomal uh, pieces and, uh, in cancer. There's extrachromosomal DNA also, which is mm -hmm. also very interesting. But probably that's, it's not going to mess up with your whole genome, right? I think my intuition is that it's not important. OK, and, and the, the last question, maybe a bit forward looking, is probably you're aware of these new methods that are coming that are you know doing a spatial single cell genomics, like they keep the, the relative position of the different cells. So I yeah. wonder whether this could bring us to phylogeography. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah no, no, we are doing it, but what, 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 what do we use for is pictures, right, of a, of a piece of a column with dots, because we have locations and we also use the coordinates in some cases. Eh? In, in the nature communication papers, we use the coordinates. We use a model that takes into account the coordinates, the diffusion model from BIST, like the one is used for viruses, it's the same one for coronavirus or whatever. Yeah, but that's RNA-seq. So single cell, 99.9% .9 is RNA-seq. Why? Because it's Thank much you. easier. It's much easier. Sure. Now, you can call SMBs yeah. from RNA-seq, yes. But then you have another layer of error. RNA-seq is easier because, of course, you have many more molecules of RNA than DNA in a single cell. And the machines, you know, I talked with this with Holger Hein, which is the one in the in charge of the single cell genome, like long time ago about all these issues about how, whether we also, there was a platform called Fluidine by then that they promised a DNA kit, but no. All the machines to do this automatic RNA. Now, it's a good question because we could use this RNA data to infer mutations, but RNA, you have the problem of, you know, the expression, heterogeneity in time and that, that, that. But certainly that will give us like a much better location. What people is doing now for this in the Sanger is laser microdissection. What they do is, you know, get a piece of tissue, do laser microdissection, and then and, uh, do mini bulk sequencing. So they sequence pools of 200 cells, which is something which is between single cell, but um, bulk, because you assume that these few cells a single clone. You can look at the buff at the variable frequency, and if it's around 0.5, then that 
those are a single clone. So people is thinking about this, right? And the, I mean, this type of stuff, there are papers coming in nature, like in, probably next, about this to a study development. No cancer, but just somatic evolution. And there, the position is very important. I mean, of course, different organs, but within an organ, whether that. But yeah, that's something I have in my mind to, to move more into spatial. So therefore, I can do the same I, I've been doing with the conus snails, right? The, the coordinate for the for the sad place. But then you have to be with RNA seq. So less SMBs, more trouble calling them. Yeah, I need to think. But as an idea, yes. Okay, so I see uh, two more. I mean, two more people asking, and this this will be the last two questions. So first, Aida, and then Alfonso. Yeah, hi. Thanks hi. Uh, for the talk. It's really interesting. Um, I'm quite far from the cancer field, where I'm working with a single cell transcriptomics, basically. So um, yeah, I I know that there are some methods that can provide the same, like the the genotype for some genes. And, uh, and uh, for example, the, the protein from the same cell, right? Um, but there are like some panel genes and, and you cannot do like whole genome as you were saying. So um, I, I'm wondering like, how far are you seeing the, the whole genome sequencing at the single cell level and the single transcriptomics, for example? Because I think that one, one thing that could be really interesting, but I don't see if it's really so far mm -hmm. from now, but one thing that could be really interesting is too, like to try to call EQTL, for example, but from the different lineages instead of like, for the moment, people are saying like to, to study single, the, like yeah. EQTLs at the cancer, they say yeah. cancer EQTLs, but why are no, really these, you know? There is a paper like this week lineage. about this. Okay, yeah, really. no. well, I mean, oh. as you know, there are a lot of single cells which mix A with B, A with C, A with D, you know, methyloma with epi, methy, yeah, epi. Yes. Transcritical. For mm -hmm. target data, you can call mutations and, and, and gene expression. For target data, you can do a lot of, you know, there are, you know, all these techniques. Now, we try some of these for uh, the, oh, some promise also for, for, whole, for whole genome, get the transcriptome and the genome, but in our hands, they didn't work. And for target, we, it doesn't work for us because we don't have enough mutations. And well, so I think that that would be what people is doing is instead of focusing on, on getting single cell data in the same way, they try to think of different ways. So one is the one I mentioned, use laser capture to just cut cells which are close together yeah. and then make sure that there's a single clone. So therefore you have a unit, a unit there, and then you can measure the gene expression of 200 cells probably, right? I assume I'm not an expert on single cell expression, but now in cancer, in colon, what you can do, and there's a paper by Andrea Sotoriva and Trevor Graham Labs this week, in fact, three in, in preprints, in which they do analyze single glands. Okay, so in colon, the, the structure of the colon is glandular, so you, you have a, a, it's like a crypt, and then at the yeah. bottom, you have like a few stem cells, and then, you know, there you have 2,000 cells, something like that, no, in the, in the colon, if I remember well, and normally they are clonal. So if you are able to isolate single, which we also tried here this, but it didn't work because our cancers were very advanced. So the glands broke. Isolate single cells, sequence them, and then you can measure the expression. And they have a paper about this. So they are measuring EQTLs, in fact, of expression. The conclusion is that genetic changes and expression are decoupled. Yeah. That gene expression, which is this a technical thing or not? It's surprising. Mm, well, you can interpret this is a, as plasticity. That's what they say. Okay, so cells are very plastic, so you can have different branches, but then the, the expressions are not correlated with the evolution of the genetic lineages, or it's just because you know gene expression is so variable, and then you are focusing on a few cells and blah blah. blah. I don't know the answer, but yeah, indeed, you know, studying at the end of the day, what cancer people care about phenotypes. Phenotypes. Yeah. I mean, genotypes yeah. is a mean to understand phenotypes, right? Functions, whether this, you have an A or a T, they don't care. They care whether this changes the function of something, no? To be able to act on this at the end of the day, no? And, and well, I think that that's very interesting if we can pursue, but maybe, maybe it's not gonna be the technique, but the way we sample, you know what I mean? Like this, like try to find the structure. Of course, this is not amenable to any kind of problem. But for example, in glandular tissues, you can try to just sample single glands and you know, it might be a way of the way we sample things 
a solution to be able to measure with accuracy expression, you know, uh, you know, 3D structure, you know, chromatin structure, methylom, whatever, you know, omic you want to do. But, you know, to measure evolution, you need a lot of SMBs. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's and therefore, what, yeah. that's not very compatible with many omics at the same time. So. But couldn't you try, like, to, to prioritize some SMBs that you think that are, like, more meaningful and then, you know, like, <laughs> yeah. uh, and not try to, to, to focus on all of them, but try to prioritize. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but this yeah. might change some on patients, yeah, yeah. you know. Pff, yeah, yeah, you, you could, yeah, uh, find some candidates. And just focus on this, right? And then do target after you yeah. do you do discovery and then you do target afterwards. Yeah, that's an idea, yes. Okay, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, thanks then, Alfonso. That's a, you know, very interesting one to see how much progress you have done. I, I don't want to take long time, but we have time to talk later. I was wondering, and I don't know if you, you already mentioned uh, you have missed it. There has been all this theory about the, the metastatic cells traveling from one uh, metastasis place to another and back to the, to the primary tumor. Yeah. So like, like migrations in your islands. Is, do you see that? Is this well, in fact, in, in, we mentioned self-seeding. You, you, you mean mm -hmm. uh, Masagues yeah. theory, which I think, you know, in here, did you see my screen again, right? We see some kind of return in our bulk paper, then we'll, we have not seen this in the, what is this? Do you see this slide here? Mm -hmm. this, this arrow is coming back from the liver to the lymph nodes of the colon. Of the colon. Mm -hmm. So after going and kind of going backwards. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I mean, Masage says that there is some kind of um, attraction, no? For, mm -hmm. for, the, for your primary home, no? For the cells and they have two papers. I don't know how much, if other people outside Ma the Masage lab have confirmed this. I don't know. We see something, but of course this is an ad hoc interpretation, right? So we mentioned, well, this is compatible with self-seeding, this kind of arrows going back from the liver to the lymph nodes, which are close to the colon. So might be initiating a self-seeding, seeding back home, mm -hmm. but we have not that. Of course, if that is something we can see with single cells, if we have the position of the cells, because the, the theory also says that the coming back, of course, is to the external part of the tumor. And yeah, that's something. That would be, that would be something. Yeah. So we have some, we can speculate around that, but we don't have any, any clear, any clear proof. My, my, my perception, I might be wrong, is that it's very polemic, this, no? Yeah, this is what I'm asking you, you can see yeah. this or not. Yeah. The, you know, it's, it's, it's gray. It's, we might want to see it, right? We, we see this return in this patient now. It's compatible, but it's not a proof of it. That, that was a very Galician answer. Oh, sorry, yeah. <laughs> bueno, <laughs> as we say. Yeah, could be, yeah. Could be. Okay, so uh, maybe I yes, think, maybe no. I think here, maybe yes, maybe no. <laughs> yeah. So, so I think here we can uh, we can finish, and I would like to thank you again for this uh, wonderful talk and the inspiring discussion that has ignited. And I know you thank have you. some discussions with uh, with some of us it's later. Yeah. So I would like everybody join me to thank again David. Uh, Thank you. And we hope you we work time. Okay. Bye bye. Okay. Bye bye. bye, -bye. Thank you, David. Thank you, David. So, Alfonso.